Let's talk Pioneer Meta. Let's talk Pioneer Format. And let's talk potential Pioneer Bands. Hey everyone, Optimus Tom here to talk Pioneer, one of my favorite Magic the Gathering formats and my preferred format of choice right now to play. I know that there is a lot of discourse going along with the fact that RCQ season has ended. The RCs are going to be starting up in their respective regions within about a month, and there is a ban announcement looming on the horizon. Now, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about how Pioneer looks or feels right now, and I guess I'm kind of in here to weigh in with my opinions as well and discuss the main topic on everybody's lips at this point in time, which seems to be Pioneer Bands. Now, one of the things I do want to kind of get out of the gate right away is I do think that the Pioneer format is enjoyable. I like being able to play a plethora of decks that have a target of the number of top decks that I know I need to be prepared to face if I want to be competitive. And I do like the fact that there are three or four top decks in the format that doesn't necessarily make it like a one or two deck format and gives a little bit of variety to the top tables, even if we do wind up seeing some of those decks over and over again in some of the more premier events. But all of this kind of kind of coming together, I wouldn't be surprised and I wouldn't be offended if there were no bans being announced at the end of August. However, I do know that a lot of people have been discussing cards that could see potential bans. So that's what I'm going to focus on here rather than trying to argue for the format is fine because it could use improvements. Now, the one thing I do want to kind of bring to the forefront of the conversation when it comes to what should be banned is the fact that Pioneer is in a precarious position right now. I don't really know how else to kind of describe it, but you can't just ban out a card from one deck and then think the format is going to be fine and adjust to it. The fact of the matter is, is because Pioneer is in a state right now where three or four decks are very powerful that if you ban one of them out of existence pretty much then the other ones are going to just consume its metagame share and you're not necessarily going to have other decks kind of be unleashed by that deck being banned instead you're going to have them being repressed by the other three decks because the one that they targeted is no longer valid. We've seen this come into effect with Mono White Humans losing the Green Devotion Karn uh, matchup and then having Amalia be a deck that just completely shut it out of the format. So if you think that you can just ban one of these decks and leave the rest as is, I think you're gravely mistaken. So what does that mean for Pioneer? I think it means that the format needs to undergo a bunch of different kinds of changes if you are looking at banning anything at all. First off, we need to talk at the top of everybody's kind of conversation list, which is the Amalia combo. Now, everybody knows that this deck is very powerful. I personally like having a deck like this in the format. Yes, even with a combo that can potentially end the game, this is a deck that a lot of people who enjoyed playing decks like Birthing Pod can kind of flock to. And even though the deck isn't so much a toolbox deck right now as it could be with future printings or a little bit of tweaking and making the combo less prominent factor of the deck, it could potentially be something that is a mainstay of the format in one way or another. Now the problem is, is that the deck is extremely consistent and fast, which means that it's not this toolbox style deck, it's actually a combo deck, and it's probably one of, if not the fastest combo deck in the Pioneer format right now, which is why a lot of people kind of put a target on its head. It's extremely easy to interrupt. You can fatal push the Amalia. They do have some recursive elements to get it back from the graveyard, but the deck doesn't just outright win and kind of feels like one of those decks, like I'm probably gonna get flame for this, but I'm just kind of spinning this off the top of my head. There's no script or anything I read out beforehand, but it kind of feels like when you were playing old school modern and people were complaining about Splinter Twin, but you were playing a deck that just ran go for the throat or doom blade or slaughter pact or something and could just deal with it there are many ways that you can deal with the amalia combos pieces but the resiliency and the fact that the deck is so heavily centered around doing this without being punished is what makes people think it needs a ban now in general a lot of people have just been saying you need to ban Amalia, just ban the new card, get that thing out of here. There's no more issues with this deck kind of being broken then because the namesake card is banned. 
However, I do think that the card that you should look at from the Amalia deck is Wild Growth Walker. Now, this do nothing card was a standard all star way back in the original Ixalan block when that was in standard. But the card in Pioneer did nothing from the creation of the format in 2019 all the way up until Amalia's printing. Knowing that Explorer is a mechanic we have only seen on Ixalan and we've gone back there once already, we can already assume that they aren't going to be printing this as a recurring mechanic, which means that Amalia will be pretty fine because Amalia herself can explore, but Amalia triggers on life gain. That means you could put Amalia in like a Soul Sister style deck or a Heliod style deck in Pioneer and still have some sort of wiggle room in gameplay. No, it's not going to be like a super high tier deck like the Amalia decks are. It might not even be a tier two deck, but I'm looking at the format from the perspective of what cards can be used to build around in other decks and what cards can be used to potentially make different archetypes that people will enjoy playing, even if they're not entirely competitive. And I feel like Amalia fits that bill way better than Wild Growth Walker does with a mechanic that is stuck on a singular plane that we're probably not going to be seeing for a while. So if you ban a card from the Amalia combo, it needs to be Wild Growth Walker. Next deck that everybody wants to talk about is Rakdos Vampires. Now this of course is, well, Probably the best deck in the format, if you ask most people. I personally think it's Amalia, but the Rectos Vampires deck is another very powerful mid-range shell with a combo inside of it. And that in and of itself is a big reason why people take issue with the deck. Now this took off originally at Pro Tour Murders at Karloff Manor. I think it was Team Channel Fireball is the masterminds behind this deck. And Everybody by now should kind of uh, by now should kind of know what the deck does. It has the standard black red mid range package. You have thought seizes, you have fatal pushes, you have shieldreds even in the deck, and fable of the mirror breaker, which has been a staple of pioneer since that card was invented in uh, Kamigawa Neon Di Dynasty. But the deck foregoes some of the different red black options like smugglers copters and inties and stuff although some of the lists still run smugglers copter uh, and then trades it in for the kindred creature type of vampire to synergize with soren imperious bloodlord now soren imperious bloodlord the ultimate ability is just a minus three put a, a vampire from your hand into play so you combine that with vein ripper a six mana a uh, flying menace of a 6-5 with multiple lines of text on it. And you have a card that is not only a game winning thing on the turn you're supposed to play it, like turn five or turn six, but it's now hitting the board on turn three and is much more difficult to move, like almost an immovable object when these other decks are not being able to pay for its ward cost successfully. Some of the decks in the format just don't play creatures. And I think that if you're being punished by a Vein Ripper that hard because you're not playing creatures, you need to reevaluate the way your deck is looking. Control players, that doesn't mean you have to play creatures. That means you need board wipes instead. That means that you need ways to kind of answer things like that. That's a little bit of a di digressing though. But this Vein Ripper coming down this early means that even creature decks don't have an extra creature around to sacrifice for the ward cost because you're following up or playing ahead of time fatal pushes and shielded edicts and go for the throats and such, maybe even bitter triumph that is going to be killing off the ward fodder for the vein ripper and then with the vein ripper resolving if you are able to double creature and play a kill spell congratulations you've been able to shut off the vein ripper for one activation and you're dying to blood tithe harvester and muta vaults and stuff so the deck in and of itself is very resilient even if you deal with its combo because it is still a very strong mid-range shell now the vampires deck has an interesting angle because a lot of people just want to ban soren Basically, people are saying if you ban Soren, you can continue to prevent uh, print powerful vampires and they will not be broken. I can completely resonate with that train of thought. And I was actually on that train of thought until I was discussing with a couple of friends of mine and one in particular kind of pointed out that if you ban Soren, you basically ban Vein Ripper as well. No pioneer decks are going to go for a six mana version of what Archfiend of the Dross can basically do at four mana. And even in these cases, 
Archfiend of the Dross is maybe being played as a two of in the Rakdos mid-range shell, while Shield or the Apocalypse kind of was your curve topper, maybe going up to Invoke Despair if you were playing against a very control or Niv to Light heavy sort of meta game where things were grindy. But by banning out Soren, Vayne Ripper doesn't really have a place to exist anymore. And if we are talking about cards from the Amalia perspective that you want to be able to have archetypes that can be built around, it makes a lot more sense to keep Soren around because it goes in these kindred style vampire decks. It goes in any sort of deck that's going to be building around the fact that it uses vampires. And we do have a couple of examples of very powerful vampires that have been printed in the last few years when Soren was legal and pioneer and haven't really done anything besides a flash in the pan. Now, like Lord Xander is the one that really comes to mind. Some people were like, oh, well, Lord Xander caught is three colors and that's why it hasn't seen play. But I'm kind of calling BS on that when Reckoner Bankbuster and all these other treasure generating things such as Fable the Mirror Breaker have been around. You're not having your mana base be taxed to play Lord Xander as like a two or three of with Soren in your list. It's just the fact that it wasn't as difficult to deal with and by using Soren and Lord Xander, you were not as impactful to the board as you were if you played Soren and Vayne Ripper. Similarly, you had Galta and Maven. This one is a little bit more easy to understand because it is green and white, so you're not really going to be able to cast it in a Rakdos shell, uh, but the Orzhov Vampires list from Old Standard, which tried in Pioneer for a little while as well, would be a home for a shell with this uh, combo inside of it because then all you need are a little bit of extra green spells. You can maybe wind up playing some Mana Dorks or something in this list and try to build it more as like an Abzan mid-range deck which i know all the sea drino fans out there absolutely love but you have these build arounds for this card and none of these seem like they're absolutely broken uh, you even have the five drop uh i think it's champion of the dusk is its name uh that draw, uh, draws cards and you lose life equal to the number of vampires you have in play that was the old standard all-star kind of one two punch combo at soren imperious blood lord none of those things seem super broken now could wizards just print another vein ripper yes they could, but if they ban Vein Ripper and keep Soren in the format, that is something that will always kind of be in the back of their minds of, we can't make another Vein Ripper. We have to make sure this thing can be dealt with or is slightly less powerful or just don't print anything that's like seven man or higher for vampires that isn't like a descendant of the Sengir family or something because vampires in general don't normally go up that high on the mana curve. So with all of that kind of rambling aside, I think if you look at the format as a whole, you could make arguments for Soren or Vayne Ripper being banned. However, considering I think that banning Soren is effectively banning two cards instead of just one, I would rather just ban, ban Vayne Ripper and then trust wizards to not print any more broken vampires. And if that's the case, you unban Vayne Ripper later down the road and ban Soren instead, and then I eat my shoe. Another deck that would need to have something leave from the list in order to kind of maintain this balance in the metagame and make sure Pioneer doesn't absolutely collapse before the RC season is the Mono Green Devotion deck. Now this deck was very powerful in the format when it had Karn the Great Creator and used uh, the Cauldron Loops to basically just gain an infinite amount of life and eventually just destroy your opponent's deck. You could loop through it the Stone Brain, just get, absolute, get rid of absolutely everything. It was basically an infinite combo and the deck was not fun to play against, especially when you're somebody who likes playing Recto Sacrifice and needs to activate their Witch's Ovens in order to do stuff to win the game. But regardless of my own personal prejudices against Karn the Great Creator. It was not a fun and interactive deck, so Karn wound up biting the bullet. Now, there were a lot of Karn enthusiasts who basically said that Nykthos stayed alive and Karn died for Nykthos' sins. They point to things like Leyline of Abundance being banned out early in the Pioneer format's iterations because it synergized extremely well with Nykthos ignoring the fact that it also made your land or else activate your nykthos almost immediately and therefore was an issue of the fact that your mana dorks plus nykthos were super overpowered 
but people are now looking at the dream devotion list and saying well it's popped back up it's more creature heavy which means that it dies to the amalia combo really really easily so if you ban something out and the amalia deck as we know it ceases to exist we go back to karn the great creator days of the metagame where we have rakdos phoenix and mono green as the top three decks and you all said you didn't like that so you have to ban something from this deck to prevent that from happening even if the deck is more balanced and fair in the way that it wins the game now so that being said i don't like blaming nykthos now i will get a lot of flack for this one i think i don't think that nykthos is a problem and when i again look at the pioneer format as a whole nykthos can do some pretty fun things I myself would love to have a mono black devotion shell where I can use gray merchant and drain people's life totals and play some very powerful black mono black creatures that we've gotten over the years. We have Shieldridge, Archfiend of the Dross, uh, Underworld Dreams is a favorite card of mine. So there's all these different kinds of things you can do with a mono black shell. We've also seen mono blue devotion or uh, big blue little green devotion where it used to use Nykthos uh, in Pioneer and Standard a, a little while ago. There's a version of this deck that existed with Nyx Lotus and you could still possibly use Nyx Lotus now, untapping it with Kiora in order to get a bunch of mana on your first turn of using it or playing it. So these mono blue shells uh, could do a bunch of things, play a ton of cards. Sometimes you want Mathasa's Oracle, sometimes you just over overwhelm the board or whatever but these are all like very fringe style decks right none of these decks are pointing to the fact that nykthos is a hugely broken card and needs to be banned if these decks were powerful i would agree 100 percent to get nykthos out of the format however there's a bit of a twofold problem with the mono green deck and why nykthos is a bit of an issue there uh, the first one I made a video about previously, which was one of my cardboard and coffee talks, where we talked about the identity of green decks. And we talked about the identity of green and Pioneer a bit, where Wizards over the years has been kind of shifting up the power and toughness on the green cards because big green creatures is kind of the identity and the way that green has kind of always operated in Magic. But big green creature is not good enough for the current game of magic so they've been upping powers and toughness they've been adding effects to the card like drawing cards or making copies of itself like vault born tyrant and uh, so many lines of text like titan of industry where it does so many different things it's almost like a swiss army knife in all these different situations and you can kind of build your deck around doing all of them at different kinds of games and different types of metas but they all have this issue that because all these things are being added onto the card to keep them from being played in three and two color decks as just these big things that win the game alongside all these other interactive multicolor spells, they slap a ton of green mana pips on them. And in doing so, they create a devotion problem, which means that the mono green devotion shell is the strongest user of Nykthos because of how powerful the mono green cards are and how many pips of mana they have. Old Growth Troll is a prime example of this. Cavalier of Thorns, even though all of those Cavaliers in that cycle had that mana cost or had that triple pip thing, that is the lasting one out of all five of them because of how it works and the effects that it has and how it plays at the list. It can replace a Nykthos, so you don't even need an untapping ability for it. These are the issues that make the mono green devotion deck super duper strong. But the thing is, is nowadays that combo takes until turn three or four to really start enabling. Unless you wind up luck sacking and high rolling into a hand with multiple or even just one ley line of the guild pact. So my argument is that the green deck as it exists currently and being able to combo on turn four is pioneer power level especially when nykthos unlike lotus field or something can just be killed by a krenko's buzz crusher it could be destroyed by a field of ruin or demolition field effect there's ways that you can deal with a nykthos and pioneer i mean damping sphere is something that completely shuts that card off even though the green deck is very adept at destroying artifacts and enchantments but there's ways you can slow them down ways you can deal with the card that's fine but on turn two having multiple ley lines out 
and then an elf, a Nykthos, and a forest means that you can generate nine devotion of mana, which then lets you cast a storm the festival with three floating mana. If you find a Kiora, you play the Kiora or you get the Kiora off of that. You untap, you have 10 mana now. Guess what? You can flash back your storm the festival. So high rolling with Leyline of the Guild Pack turns what could be an acceptable turn four combo that, once again, a lot easier to interact with. They find the Uvenwald oddity, you go for the throat the Uvenwald oddity, and they have to wait a turn cycle and you can just board wipe them or extinction event them because almost everything in that deck is an odd mana cost except for Uvenwald oddity. But the fact that you can do this on turn two instead, or turn three instead with ley lines of the guild pact in the in the format is the same reason why people dislike the amalia deck so why would you get rid of the nykthos which is perfectly fine operating on turn four or five in a balanced card when you just could just get rid of the free spell that completely makes the deck broken so from the mono green devotion deck i would say bye bye to ley line of the guild pact and lastly you have to do something with is it phoenix now Again, this may be more controversial, but uh, from just looking around the Pioneer community and talking with my friends in the stores that I go to and everything, people have kind of come around to the fact that Phoenix is not the most oppressive deck in the world, and Phoenix is not the biggest threat in Pioneer right now. Its metagame share has actually fallen down to third or fourth, depending on the day of the week that you really look at it on MTG Goldfish, but the deck in and of itself while it still operates a powerful combination of spells that puts out multiple arclight phoenixes onto the battlefield has kind of been toned down as it has an even maybe slightly unfavored matchup against vampires is okay into amalia but also kind of gets stonewalled by a very powerful mono green opening so the deck doesn't necessarily have the best matchups in the world right now and it's not necessarily a bad deck but it's still a problematic deck for some players now some people might just say ban arclight phoenix that's the silliest thing in the world i think i've heard you don't want to just kill the deck outright and shift it into like a prowess style deck or something just because the three two flyer for four mana is something that comes back a couple of times there's graveyard hate that completely shuts that angle off and we've seen them be able to pivot into a crackling drake plan that doesn't even make the phoenixes that much of a threat in post board games and sometimes they even sideboard them out entirely in order to go to a uh, young pyromancer and crackling drake and stuff i don't think hitting arc late phoenix is the way to do it the phoenix in and of itself is fine even if you wind up sometimes high rolling into four of them in your graveyard and then putting them out as early as like turn three or four i think that's fine decent pioneer power level there's answers that are printed to that a lot of people have been pointing at treasure cruise and i know that i've echoed this into the eons and just all over my YouTube channel and probably all of Reddit as well on the R Pioneer MTG subreddit. But I think that the delve spells in Pioneer are something that wizards were very aware of wanting in the format because the fact that they banned all of the fetch lands. This also means that triomes and shock lands are difficult to find and that you're three mana base decks or more three color mana base decks or more are more difficult to operate successfully in pioneer although you still have like niv to light and lotus field combo decks that are able to cheat on those mana or build the decks that will operate fast enough to kind of get away with those mana bases but without the fetch lands the dell spells are a lot weaker phoenix is one deck that can take advantage of treasure cruise specifically with a certain sequence of cards and in doing so, you kind of go away from what your main Phoenix game plan used to be, which was just putting as many Phoenixes into play as quickly as possible. You go for this more consistency angle, which again, gets completely shut off by the fact that you put in a single unlicensed Hurst, Rest in Peace, Leyline of the Void, uh, Soul Guide Lantern, whatever. One graveyard piece, hate piece, completely destroys the treasure cruises in your opponent's deck. However, Treasure Cruise on turn three is a very real possibility. You can do this by just casting a Consider, 
following it up with a free the fay from the adventure side of picklock prankster and then if you chain together two one mana cant cantrips you have five six seven cards in your graveyard if one of them is a consider you could even have an eighth card being a arc light phoenix then you pay the one mana for the treasure cruise as your third spell for the turn you get everything out of your graveyard except for that one Arclight Phoenix if you've binned it otherwise you have everything out of your graveyard you draw three cards on turn three and you've basically gone back up to you know somewhere between four and six cards in hand and your opponent has kind of just sat there only going draw go or maybe helping you along the way by thought seizing something out of your hand early on so some people don't really like that ability to draw three that quickly the first treasure cruise is usually not the most effective either because if they tap out for it, you can kind of follow it up with your hand disruption because you're not trying to get them to accelerate it that fast and then pick off the following treasure cruises, which is where the issue really kind of stems from. When you chain together multiple treasure cruises and you draw six to nine cards over the course of two or three turns, that starts to look like a problem. But at that point, I want to look at how we're being able to cash treasure crews that quickly that low of a mana cost that consistently and the big thing that arclight phoenix decks have gotten in recent amounts of time that has really kind of pushed the deck up in power level is picklock prankster now not the creature side of it but the free the fey part of it previously you had strategic planning or you had pieces of the puzzle in these arclight phoenix decks both of which put multiple cards in the graveyard and at the case of pieces of the puzzle could put multiple cards in your hand now both of these could find a treasure cruise while filling up your graveyard but most importantly both of these cards are sorcery speed most specifically pieces of the puzzle is a three mana sorcery which means that turn three treasure cruise is completely off the menu so in order to achieve your arc light uh, your sorry treasure cruise on turn three with this card you would need to turn one consider put that card in the graveyard turn two strategic planning put three total cards in the graveyard including the strategic planning so then you have five cards then you would have to go cantrip cantrip treasure cruise all at sorcery speed which means that you cannot hold up interaction on your opponent's turn two in case you decide to counter or burn away something and that makes the debt then therefore delaying yourself or choosing to assess the threat rather than forcing you to tap out and then your opponent having free reign not worrying about spell pierces or torch the towers or anything the pieces of the puzzle route can put all those cards in the graveyard if you don't hit anything uh it can put phoenixes in your graveyard too which is very powerful and it looks at five cards you can take up to two uh sometimes you only wind up having one hit and that's all you need to do you put four cards in the graveyard then you untap and you can cast a treasure cruise like right from the get-go on turn four however again this not only taps the phoenix player out on turn three but then means that you're not getting the treasure cruise turn you're not getting the arc light phoenix pop off until turn four which is a whole turn cycle later than it currently does which is perfectly fine and i think it's where phoenix was before and phoenix was still a presence in the format at that point in time picklock prankster however at instant speed puts three cards in the graveyard finds your treasure cruise more importantly it also finds brazen borrower which like is a one or two of in some of these phoenix decks that just bounces hate pieces as well so this picklock prankster is actually enabling the ability to find your anti-hate pieces even through you know a rest in peace or something which is problematic in and of itself but digressing from that you just be able to pass up with two mana cast free the fey if you threat assess uh, the fact that whatever your opponent has done on their turn two is not going to immediately hinder your treasure cruise uh, dilemma or anything and then you can just go for your turn three treasure cruise super consistently because you've found the treasure cruise you've found the consider you've found the one card that you absolutely need on your opponent's turn and you can just do it more consistently so if you do wind up hitting something from the Arclight Phoenix deck, I don't think you ban the Treasure Cruise, even if Treasure Cruise 2 and 3 are a little problematic. I think you ban the Picklock Prankster. It makes the deck overall a little weaker to aggro strategies as well. It has to crush on things like Ledger Shredder instead in order to play defense, and that creature has to tap to attack, so it can't play defense and offense and will overall slow the deck down both in combo turns, Treasure Cruise turns, and just life total races.
Now, those are the four top decks that I think would all need something shaken up from them in order for the format to kind of rebalance itself in time for the RC without shifting just into a two deck type format. I don't think any of the other decks that are really up there in the metagame share really need anything hit from them. Niv to Light is a slower, super mid-range deck and is always going to be around in some way shape or form as long as omnath uh, is av available in the format but without the fetch lands this deck is way more fair way more balanced even if you bring delight for valky and flip over tibble nothing needs to be banned from that deck similarly azorius control has gotten a lot of new tools you've got no more lies you still have to ferry the wandering emperor is a huge boon for that deck nothing from that deck needs to be touched sunfall got printed recently which means that the deck is a little bit more resilient against some of these uh some of the creature based decks exiling things away so if they have any sort of recursion or graveyard shenanigans or dies triggers doesn't really matter but that deck is always going to be a slow controlly kind of thing and in a format where decks running things like slick shot show off i don't think that that deck is going to necessarily need anything to knock it down a peg in a format where thought sees is super prevalent that deck is not going to need anything to knock it down a peg uh, speaking of the slick shot show off angle nothing from the girl prowess deck needs to be taken away slick shot show off can win gains very very quickly even as early as turn three out of nowhere as long as you have another prowess creature however you need a very specific sequence of cards and in doing so your red based prowess deck whether it's red green red white or mono red wizards you need a specific sequence of cards and don't have the ability to draw them or dig for them so the deck is up to very high variance it is an aggro deck sure it can win on turn four turn five very consistently but if it doesn't win by then it really fizzles out and i don't think anything needs to be banned from that deck either some people just have cards they don't really like. Thought Seize is one of those cards, and Fable the Mirror Breaker is another one. There are a lot more people clamoring for a Fable the Mirror Breaker ban, you know, three maybe months ago, maybe even a little longer ago than that. But since then, that kind of clamoring has died down. Fable the Mirror Breaker is here to stay. It kind of ties together a couple of fringe tier two or three decks, like the Creativity decks, the Enigmatic Incarnation decks, and even some of the Niv to Light lists. So that card, if you take that one away, it is going to absolutely rock the format from the bottom parts of the tiers. So if you take that away and ban stuff from the top decks, Good luck trying to figure out what to play for the RC because that's a whole shakeup of a format. Thought Seize is the other one that I mentioned uh, here. It's something that people always complain about. I do not think that Thought Seize is ever going to be a card that sees a ban. That's like saying you need to ban Duress because you want to cast spells in your deck. It's just a card that Black has that does things that Black wants to do. And yeah, you can put it in any sort of deck that is splashing Black and not only a Black based deck, but you're using a card to take away something from your opponent. It's very, very punishing if they've had the mulligan or in combination with other resource denial cards. And to that, I say, yes, that's exactly what that style of deck wants to do. You take Thoughtseize away from that deck, those decks are not as prevalent, and combo decks are much, much more powerful. So don't think Thoughtseize needs to be addressed at all. Now you can tell I've been a little bit more casual, a little bit more calm, and I didn't script anything out for this type of video. These are conversations I've been having over the past almost year, it feels like, when it comes to Pioneer. And I'm pretty solid and set in my, my thoughts as to how the format is designed and how the format should be shaken up and looked at in power level. I'm still learning different things every day when it comes to the format. I enjoy playing it. I commentate on the format and obviously do content like this on my YouTube channel for the format constantly. But I'm still learning things like when you ban Soren, you also probably ban Vayne River from the format and kind of, you know, being convinced that there are other sides of every single argument, which is why I present a video like this where a lot of my arguments may be counterintuitive to what the whispers or the hive mind of people that are talking about the Pioneer format may say. So I just kind of want to open that discussion up and tell people kind of to consider multiple angles when you're talking about bans or talking about unbanned even, to try to figure out what is the format that I am looking for? Does it align with what we know about Pioneer right now or what we knew about it when it was introduced back in 2019? And 
is this a format that I still want to keep playing? Because I know for a fact that some people kind of came in from modern, they want to play their Delve spells. If Delve spells get banned, they're just going to leave the format. That's fine. Maybe that's, that's just not the format that they want to play in. And that's the format that some other pioneer players want to play in. But if you're on the opposite side and you think that the Delve spells are ruining your enjoyment, maybe you need to go check out modern after Nadu is banned. So all those thoughts on the table, I do want to know what everybody here thinks. So just let me know down in the comments below. And if you've enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Otherwise, the YouTube algorithm may wind up banning me at the end of August. Not really. It's just that the thumbs up help the video get a lot of views and everything. But if you enjoyed this type of content, you can always tap that subscribe button to follow my YouTube channel for more deck techs, metagame analysis, and in general, magic content. See you after the bands.